Test, test. Hello, uh, uh, there you are. fellow uh, people. Well hey, done. Well, I think we get started, and I'm, I'm sure more people will join us as the, in the coming minutes. I just want to say thanks for joining. I mean, the reason I wanted to do this was to build up the community and, and keep us together during this time. And um, I think that a, a video chat like this is, is the way to go. Um, I mean, I had no idea when we had the flea market where I saw Bob and Todd at just March 8th, that, that was gonna be the last thing we'd be doing for the foreseeable future. And is actually today was gonna be our day. We should be at Francis Tavern right now on our like our second beer, you know, and that got canceled as well too. Mm. So, you know, I think this will be a fun thing to do. Good to get everybody together and talking, keep the juices flowing. And I think for the three guys who are going to be talking to us tonight, you, it's a really good kickoff. Um, so what I want to do is each guy is going to talk for a few minutes, 10 minutes or more, do a Q and A, and then um, see what we got going after that. Um, so I'm going to start off with Bob. And also I want to say we have not just Germany where, where Jared is, Todd's in New Jersey, Chris is in Pennsylvania, Bob's in Connecticut, Luke, are you in Delaware? Yes. Tom, Luke you're in? Delaware. Uh, DT. That's amazing. Hey, Sandy. Sandy, can you hear us? And Chris, are you still in your old place or your new place? Me, Chris, Chris? Hi. Yeah, we're in DC until, uh, I think he's talking to me because I'm moving. Um, we're in DC until June and then we go up to Boston. Okay. Uh-oh, Queens is in the house, too. Hey, Joe. What's up? So I'm going to turn it over to um, to Bob Jacobs first. He's going to kick things off. OK. And um, Bob, the floor is yours. OK, welcome, everybody. Uh, you're getting a, a rare treat up into um, my museum. Kevin was up here uh, oh, a couple of years ago. I don't let too many people up here. The last guy I got up here told me I needed this help, so I decided not to invite people anymore. Uh, but uh, we'll, we'll kind of get past the, uh, past the vicars. And I wanted to show you guys some really interesting uniforms. I'm really, I'm really a uniform guy at heart, and I'm really an Air Corps, Air Service guy, uh, because my father was a, a World War II uh, B-17 guy, so I kind of grew up with airplanes um, as a kid growing up in the 50s. But I thought I'd show you some some really special um, aviation uniforms. Uh, let's let's start with this one. Uh, this was Major uh, Victor Strom. Victor Strom was a 91st Aero Squadron. And this, you know, a real honest, just the way the uniform was um, in its day. The wing, wing badge has never been changed. Uh, wow. Strom would later go on. This is. Uh, Here's, here's Strom's tags. Okay. Mm. Uh, Strom would later go on. Strom had five kills in the first war. Um, he would later go on to be a general. And again, he was, uh, he was famous 91st Aero Squadron. Okay. So slide down, we're going to slide down to over here, which is, a uh, again, an air service uniform. Again, same kind of patch. The nice early, the nice early honest. Um, is that coming in clear, guys? I'm not sure. Focus isn't fantastic, but it looks okay. It's fine. Looks okay. Yeah, it's coming in clear. Okay, good. Um, which really makes this interesting is is that whose it was? Um, the, the, this was a guy named uh, 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 Georgie Turnour. Uh, Turnour was a New Yorker who uh, was in the uh, Lafayette Escadrille. And what makes it even more special is here's his escadrille uniform. Uh, these are oh, things wow. you're see. That's, that's one of the original uh, uh, Stork uh, escadrille pins. Uh, his Quad de Guerre and his uh, Lafayette escadrille ribbon with the Indian head um, applied to it. That's incredible. 
And the interesting thing is, is these uniforms did not come together. These uniforms were separated by probably 75 years and, um, and many miles. The, um, the Escadrille uniform had been, had been donated by his family in 1920, and it was donated to, to the Museum of the City of New York. Uh, how it came into my possession is, is that I'm involved with a museum group here in Connecticut who was, uh, who was privy to the uh, disp dispensation of, or, or the disposition of uh, um, extra uniforms from the Museum of the City of New York. Um, and because I was president of the museum, um, I was given the, 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 uh, the long-term care of, of Turner's uniform. Uh, about a year later, um, another collector put up Turner's um, air service uniform. And the interesting thing is, is that if we look here, this is where his French badge would have been. There's the, the, uh, the loops. And when I found the air service uniform, there was his French badge, which he put on the uh, US uniform. Um, Tenor, Incredible. Yeah, Tenor unfortunately dies in 1920. Uh, some people say that it was for too much partying. Uh, uh, Lodge. Not quite sure. It was not, as I know it, he was not a, uh, uh, he, he, it wasn't the influence that did him in. I think it was just too much, uh, too much of a good time. Um, let's, <laughs> let's go to this, this guy over here. Um, kind of plain, but a nice, beautiful badge. The type of badge that be actually be uh, taken off because it has a pin back. So the guys didn't want to ruin their, their bullion badges, so they had pins on. Um, with five badges, uh, this, this uniform is, uh, is named to uh, 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 William Loomis. William Loomis was also Lafayette Escadrille and um, a 94th Aero Squadron. <clears throat> Again, fam famous aviators. My collection of aviation stuff is really guys that flew over the front. Um, I, I, I don't look for um, generic uniforms. I, I like stuff that was actually there. Uh, keeping keeping with, the, uh, with the allies is this really nice early French pilot. Uh, it's, it's, it's exactly the way I got it from, from the previous collection. So I'm not sure what he added and what he didn't add to it, uh, but it is an honest early style uh, aviation unit for someone who was first in the engineers. Uh, it does yeah. limit whom it could be. Uh, um, I have some theories as to whose I thought it is, because there were very few guys that transferred from the engineers. But the interesting way is, uh, is uh, aviation insignias were applied right over the engineer, and stuff, which is kind of cool. Um, it was presented to me as being the uniform of, of Rene Montrion, but it is not Rene Montrion's. Rene Montrion was not in the engineers. There's the beautiful um, large uh, air service insignia and, and rank. So pretty cool stuff in, in this department. Uh, another interesting piece is, is, um, is this, which is a a, it, which is an aviation cadet. They talk, we're talking about uh, uh, campaign hats and stuff. We were at the show. Mm -hmm. um, probably the only time you've ever seen an honest aviation cadet um, uh, campaign hat. And what's nice about it, it is marked inside to a place, West Point, Mississippi, <laughs> which was like a World War I training base. Mm. So very honest. And, and what they were was actually just an officer's cap you know, and simply when they received their commission, they would just take the white band off. Mm -hmm. That's why you, you don't see too many of those. That's super cool. Um, yeah, sliding back. Hey, to, uh, do I have a five more minutes? Sure. Well, how am I doing? Okay. Five more minutes. We'll, go, we'll, walk, we'll walk back in here to, to the, uh, to the uh, allies and uh, some of my favorite stuff. These are, again, a 1919 the lights coming not so good. Let's see if we can smell it. These are two uniforms um, that belong to a guy by the name of James E. Weiser. Uh, hey, anybody want to recognize any? Hey, Todd, anybody there? You want to try to recognize what the uniform is? It's a uh, RN. Yeah, mm -hmm. naval. Go back and go back earlier. Well, it's Royal Naval Air Service. Hmm. Royal Navy Lesser is prior to, to the to the merging in 19 um, with the R, R, with the Royal Flying Corps to form the Royal Air Force. 
Hmm. Um, same guy. Wow, that's before. incredible. This, this that is, is super going cool. Before. It's dated. It's dated. This one's dated 1919. When I when I bought the form, the guy says, "Well, I'm going to throw this one in. Here's his World War II uniform." When in fact, what that was was his Royal Naval Air Service uniform, which predated the, or the other one. Wow. Uh, pretty rare. Yeah, not pretty cool. Yeah, I like that. That was that was a good find. Um, and then 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 there's just a couple other little things in here, just a, a bunch of other. We look over here. It's, it's a uh, 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 139th Aero Squadron. This guy was the chauffeur of the 139th Aero Squadron, and that's 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 one of the real honest First Army Air Service uh, insignias with the squadron insignia on it. So ra rather than me keep you guys more. Uh, you know, because I've, I've got probably about 20 pilots' uniforms of guys that flew over the front. Oh, let's do one more, and then I'll get, then I'll get off. Last one. <laughs> get away from there. Let's just look at this. Uh, American Field Service. The stuff you don't see every day. Real early one. About, about 1950. And, of course, these are the guys that were driving am ambulances. This is not named... Uh, but it is the type of uniform that would have worn, been worn by somebody uh, uh, driving the ambulances for the uh, American Hospital in Paris uh, in 1915. Pretty cool stuff. So, with that, I'll 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 sign off from here or take any questions. Yeah, does anybody have any questions for Bob? I'm in shock. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the only proper response is that that's just so phenomenal. Oh, I'm glad you like, I knew you guys would appreciate that stuff. I used to take some of that stuff out to shows, but it's just too valuable today to take out. So it, it, it stays home. Well, I want to welcome some of the people that just joined us. We have Rachel, you know, Chris is, Chris, are you in Brooklyn? I sure am. Brooklyn in the house. Yes. Happy belated St. Patrick's Day. With Slanch to all. Joe, watching in Queens. Yeah. Representing. Danger Joe. Thought it was a party. <laughs> <laughs> Liked your tour of the park. Where are you watching from? Where, where are you located, Rachel? I'm just southwest of Philly in Delaware County, Pennsylvania. All right. Sorry for being a little late. We have like six states in Germany. That's mm -hmm. so amazing. That's so cool. Um, so next up is Todd. It's, it's. Uh, well, I'm going to put on the spotlight here. Uh, significantly less exciting than what Bob has shown off. Um, and for some of you guys, a lot of this will be kind of old news. But uh, for those of you who are so inclined and are interested in any gas equipment, um, this should be interesting. So I've got some uh, any gas equipment, sort of from the American perspective. Um, everything from the British version of the uh, small box respirator, uh, French M2s, the American versions. So, I mean, uh, if, if uh, this is something where you guys have more questions um, on how all this stuff was implemented, um, I've got a lot of primary source documents related to uh, the Americans' perspective on gas warfare. Uh, the Americans uh, training on gas warfare, as well as a bunch of cool little accessories that um, are not super common. So um, if you'd like, we can just start with um, the basics and kind of run through the, the masks themselves. And if you want to get into the weeds and talk about anything in more detail, we can get into that. So hopefully that works. Um, so as far as if you were to look at an American uh, who has all their equipment on, and uh, wonder what kind of mask do they have? You'd see probably one of a few things. Um, the first, um, for those who were over earlier on, you'd be looking at something like a British small box respirator. Uh, this looks a lot like the American version, except that if you ever see one, it will have these round snaps typically. And in addition to that, they will also have this very distinctive adjustment buckle that'll let you length, adjust the length of this haversack when it's worn in the reserve position. So that would be on your left side, like so. And unlike the American versions, the alert position 
is achieved via this little brass stud on the strap and a leather tab on the side of the respirator haversack. Um, so if you're trying to look at a photo and, and guess what kind of equipment they're using, if you see these features, you'd be like, you'd be keyed into the fact that this is a British haversack. Um, cool thing about this particular example is that it was obviously identified to a particular individual in the 80th Division, the 317th Infantry uh, Machine Gun Company. And on the other side here, we have their uh, regimental distinction, which is a circle red and blue. And then obviously the 80th Division uh, patch, uh, which is painted up on the side of it. Um, the mask itself, these are usually not in terribly great condition, and this one is really no exception. Uh, some of the markings we have on the inside are the original manufacturer's information, uh, the date of manufacture, which is 1917 in this case. Uh, the distinctive part about the masks, if you were to ever look at a photo and say, hey, what kind of mask is that? The British masks have this very distinctive right angle joint. Uh, this valve here, this is your, your inlet and exhaust valve. So your clean air would be coming through this hose, which would be going through the filter. And then the um, dirty air or your uh, exhaust would be going through this valve, which would have a little rubber flapper valve on it for the exhaust. Um, there are a few distinct accessories that go with these. Uh, one of which, which is ubiquitous to all of these masks, is a uh, little booklet which would be attached to the filter itself. And in this little booklet is a few things. There are these patches on the side of it. Those are actually repair patches. So if you found a hole in your mask, you could use that to patch that mask up. And on the inside of this booklet, you would see a few pieces of information. And this one's really cool because it's actually reasonably well filled out. And I'm not sure if my focus is going to behave here. Uh, but you have the date of issue, uh, who it was issued to, uh, as well as there is a record of um, what type of gas and it was exposed to and for how long this gas, uh, you were exposed to that gas. Uh, the lifespan on a small box respirator like this one is between 50 and 100 hours, depending upon the concentration of the gas that you were exposed to. Uh, so this particular fellow has a record of um, uh, one half hour of drill uh, on one line, quarter hour of drill on another line, and a rec record of one hour of shell gas. So shell gas as opposed to gas, which is released as a big cloud, um, which by 1918, when most Americans were over fighting, that was deployed by artillery as opposed to these very elaborate um, setups required to release cloud gas. Um, so he's got an hour, half hour, half hour, five hours on this tag. So it's, it's, this is a fascinating example that um, actually has some service logged on it. I won't pull, pull out the canister on this one because um, these British canisters have a tendency to rust from the outside in. Uh, they were shellacked on the outside, but they weren't treated on the inside. So you've got this giant sponge pulling in moisture from its environment for 100 years and slowly rots the inside out. So that's a nice British mask. Uh, the British, obviously, that was their primary uh, any gas equipment from around uh, 1916 all the way through the rest of the war um, and was the basis for the American mask. Um, so obviously the first Americans going overseas, they would see um, both the British mask and the French masks. Um, so we've got a few interesting examples here of the more common French masks. This was called the M2 and um, We've got a couple interesting pieces. We've got one cover, just the bag, unfortunately, no, uh, no mask, but uh, an identified American used M2 carrier. Uh, and these were very similar to the um, American or rather British respirators in that this was worn around the neck, 
and it was tied off to a alert position very much like this one was. Um, this wasn't the most elaborate method to get you to an alert position, but it worked, right? So this was uh, a lot different than a, 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 a British small box respirator because this did not have a canister. This does not have a hose. The canister respirators worked by having a specific box where all the filtration happens. The air would be pulled from the bottom of that canister up through to uh, where you were or where you were inhaling that, that air. Uh, the M2 operates in a rather different method. Uh, this is the M2, and it has a very, um, very distinctive appearance. If you were to actually put this on, it kind of looks like a, a beak or a duckbill or something, right? Now, the method that this uses is that you've got about 20 layers of cloth that forms a bit of a mask that you jam your face into. And rather than breathing through a hose, you're breathing through the cloth itself. So you've got contaminated air coming through those layers of material. And also your exhaust is going through those layers of material. Um, so um, on one hand, this is a relatively comfortable mask to wear because uh, you don't have a mouthpiece that you have to bite onto. You don't have anything cutting off your, your uh, respiration at all whatsoever. Uh, but on the other hand, this is, you can imagine not being a most spectacular uh, fit or seal. This is just, this isn't rubberized along this edge here. This is just cloth. Um, and the, the anti-gas component was soaked into these layers of cloth. In fact, this one smells interesting. Um, and then this outer layer here is just a um, impermeable flap, basically to keep the moisture and rain from getting on the impregnated uh, fabric. Okay. And um, I, I'll have to double check this, but I was just reading uh, earlier today that the anti-gas component was uh, sodium thiosulfate, which I believe is a, a, a very efficient silver cleaner, believe it or not. Um, so one of the other components that comes with these carriers, you would see, you can probably already see it already, there's a little pouch right here. And on the inside, we've got a pretty simple carrier, but that little pouch has a um, little pocket for a spare lens. So obviously, if these things get damaged, um, you want to be able to act expeditiously to repair these sort of things. Um, some of the other th interesting bits on these is that there is a size marking on all these masks. So on the haversack itself, this was um, basically small size picky. Uh, and then on the mask itself, you would find somewhere, uh, here it is, that same size marking. Um, so these were um, issued to the AEF rather widely initially. And that, uh, came to an end in May of 1918. The thing with the M2 versus the small box respirator is that the small box respirator is unbelievably uncomfortable. Um, you, it, it cuts off your air flow through your nose uh, by a little spring clip. Uh, it forces you to bite down on this little rubber uh, mouthpiece and is really not a pleasant experience. The lenses fog up even though oh, you have, to that. what's that? I said, I'll attest to that. It, they're not fun. <laughs> no, they're not. So um, the problem that that created was that Americans who were being exposed to um, uh, German gas would be wearing their, their small box respirator and they would be uh, safe as can be, but then they would start to get uncomfortable. And once they start to get uncomfortable to um, the extreme, which if you can imagine wearing something like this for two, four, five, ten hours, it would start to wear on you. And so what the Americans would often do is since these had, they were equipped with both the small box respirators and the M2 as a reserve mask, men would try to sneak out of their SBRs 
and into their M2s because like they would say this was more comfortable, this was easier to wear along for long periods of time. But in doing so, if you can imagine kind of like a hermit crab coming out of its shell to go to a bigger shell, the Americans trying to get out of their small box respirators and into their M2s, oftentimes they would gas themselves. They're going from a, a position of being safe and protected from the gas to a position where they're exposing themselves. And if they accidentally breathe before they get this fitted properly, they would, they would gas themselves basically. And so the AAF saw this as a problem and eventually in May of 1918 decided that these were no longer going to be issued widely as a reserve respirator. Um, so these, these start going away. So by the time you get to the Mu Sargon Offensive, you see men just wearing their small box respirators. Or in, uh, if you go along far enough, you start getting into American respirators. Uh, this is the uh, corrected English mask. Uh, there is an interesting history of how Americans came to possess a respirator which worked effectively. They actually went through a few versions that did not work very well. Um, but by the, uh, by the time you start seeing wide issue of American respirators, they are very similar to the British one. You hold them side by side and you can see that fundamentally they're not that different. But um, uh, the, the details are a little bit different. The American ones have these fancy elliptic dots, which are pretty noticeable. And then of course the, uh, the straps have a very distinctive arrangement of how you go from the reserve position to the alert position. So the most common version of the American haversacks have this uh, spring clips. So you can just snap those together and you've got your reserve or uh, alert position. Cool, that was a lesson learned for me, man. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, and the, the American respirators um, took a lot of the uh, design details from the British design. Uh, so you'll see a lot of things which are, are very similar. However, the mask itself has this angled joint and it has a uh, get this in a better view. It has a guard around the flutter valve. You see where there's the exhaust valve there and it has a big sheet metal guard on it. For whatever reason, the British decided that they didn't want their masks um, built with those guards on it. Uh, the very early versions of the British small box respirator had it, but later on, for some reason, which I don't under understand currently, uh, those were removed. So um, in addition to that, the American version had, of course, a little tag that was attached to the uh, filter, just like the British version. And uh, inside of this has a few interesting things, just like the British version. It's got a pocket for repair plasters. So these guys right here. So rather than being on the outside of the tag book, you've got a separate pad of those repair filter or uh, patches. It has a little safety pin to adjust the fit and length of the adjustment straps on the outside of this mask. Got a bunch of those. And uh, of course, just like the British mask, it's got all different places for you to log your types of gases exposed to, your hours exposed, all that fun stuff. Um, and of course, state issued unit, all that fun information. Uh, because obviously, uh, if you were putting your dirty mouth on this disgusting contraption, you wanted to at least be able to verify that this is in fact yours or someone else's or how long it's been used. Does it need to be replaced? All that information is very important for, um, for people in the field who under the duress of combat might not have the luxury of verifying these things by any other means. Um, so uh, the only other little accessory that comes with these is um, uh, the anti demon compound. Like I mentioned, the, um, these had a tendency to fog up the small box respirators. So uh, the Americans, and these are really reasonably common on the, the collector market. The idea with this is that after you use it, you would take this little canister, and take out the little rag that came with it, 
And this is basically kind of like soap that you would um, make a little paste, wipe on the inside of your lenses, and <clears throat> polish off that uh, excess to um, ideally mitigate some of the condensation that would form from your uh, hot, exacerbated, uncomfortable face um, and breath forming and condensing on the lenses. Um, a cool little thing we have from the British version, and these are, these are kind of hard to come by because they're contained in a paper box. And these have a tendency to fall apart and uh, go uh, missing over time. And of course, these have very similar instructions, um, but the difference is that any dimming compound is in a same, comes with a rag, but it's in a little tube, which is about as much nuance as a weirdo collector like myself would get excited about. But uh, it's interesting to see that um, eventually, as time went on, the British started using um, the uh, any gas tins very much like the American designs did. And the British ended up using the small box respirators through World War II. And uh, they would change, like, like a lot of things in, in warfare and technology, the materials were better. The materials uh, were more durable and they improved a lot of the designs with these masks, but the fundamental concepts of the small box respirator didn't change until um, mid-World War II, which is interesting. Um, so if anyone has any questions or thoughts on how these were implemented or trained on, or I can go into more excruciating detail. Actually, Hopefully yeah. you'll find that interesting. I was wondering, how long does the French gas mask last? Like, it, it, does that have a set lifetime for that one too, or was it just you used it until uh, to get hold the new one? Yeah, I'm um, interested in knowing that too. The and Jared might know this better than I do. Um, yeah. Let's see here. So I can I can answer a little bit about that. So the thing about the French M2 mask is that. Uh, because the uh, the composition of gas kept changing back and forth, uh, the Germans and the French were throwing stuff at each other. And so the French would just keep uh, pretty much, uh, if you've seen those like fire buckets at the front, they would keep that with the latest composition of the counter agent to the latest German agent. Hmm. And so you would dip your stuff in that and then put it back <laughs> on your face. Um, <laughs> so oh, Lord knows great. what they were exactly. <laughs> you talk about research development. It means they're putting all sorts of chemicals directly against the skin trying to yeah. counter in it and just going back and forth with it. Um, and that lasted until they eventually came up with the ARS-17 mask. But even then, you still had to care a primary mask and a backup mask. And yeah. even into 1918, you'll see a lot of those M2 masks still being carried as a backup mask. And especially in the rear area, there's all these photographs of the AEF wearing them on mm -hmm. work details. Because mm -hmm. when the supervisors say you have to wear a gas mask, what are you going to carry with you? The small box respirator or this M2 mask you put in a pocket? Yeah. 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 And then um, to, to his point, um, the, the, those of you who know what the German masks look like, which I can pull out for you, the uh, ARS was very uh, similar. In fact, this is, this is probably a, a post-war, just post-war Belgian version, but the, uh, the tin itself is from 1918 and the mask, the design, Let's see, he, he's, he's pulling one out now. <laughs> yeah, hold on, I got, I got one right behind me. Yeah, here we go. So, yeah. Uh, Just kind of compare this. So you can see the two. So that's the ARS one yeah. right here. But you so can see the, the only. Two. Go ahead. Yeah, it's just like the German mask. It's, it's almost a dead copy off of the German mask. Mm -hmm. uh, give me a second. Uh, we can show you the difference. Okay, so now that's the ARS. That was a copy fundamentally of the, the German style masks. The early masks that the Germans made were um, rubberized cloth, very similar to the um, style used on the American uh, face pieces. Um, but later on, the uh, German um, ability to find proper materials, uh, it was a bit strange for them, as one might be, I'd understand. So eventually they, uh, they went to the uh, leather face piece. Uh, and these are kind of a terrifying looking mask. 
but you can see the the design uh, very closely mirrors what the the French ended up doing because this is what came first. Um, the the GM 15, the Gummy Mask 15. So all the way back in 1915, when the Germans really first started pushing gas warfare, they had a pretty advanced style of mask. Um, and fundamentally, this isn't that different from how a lot of um, mass, gas masks work today. Um, obviously not the, the very simple sort of surgical or M95 masks that we're hearing a lot about these days, but like a, um, an N99 or an N100 mask, they've got these big honking filters that you have to breathe through. Um, so you can see like this is, this was sort of set the standard for anti-gas equipment early on in the war. Um, but believe it or not, these had a very um, a short lifespan in service uh, to the tune of maybe five or 10 hours, depending on the concentration of gas versus the small box respirator, which was hugely um, outclassing something like this, right? So the superiority that the Germans had in their anti-gas equipment was reasonably well eclipsed by the equipment that the British, the Americans uh, were using. Let's give, um, let's give a jump over to Chris now. Before we, before we get out of this, Jared, to your point of the uh, anti-gas compounds, one of the things that the DuPont company worked on in a big way during World War I is trying to figure out some of these neutralizing compounds to use for small box respirators, which I thought was pretty interesting to come across that. And uh, yeah. the, the, two, the two things that DuPont did for the Chemical Warfare Service was peril and eyepieces for the American respirators and the neutralizing compounds for the uh, filters yeah. themselves. No, absolutely. And you'd be surprised, you know, what's actually in the charcoal filters, I mean, a lot of people may or may not know this, but it's like, it's peach pits, it's fruit pits that were turned into charcoal and then used in the respirators. And um, I attended, again, a great lecture last year on like the environmental history of World War One, where they explained like the, the peach pit gathering campaign in the United States was absolutely insane. Like you, to get into a movie theater, a kid could turn in five peach pits and go watch a, a picture show. And that's one of the ways that they were collecting pits because they didn't have enough of them. And there wasn't enough fruit in the U.S. to make enough of the carbon to put inside of the gas mass. So or, excuse me, enough of the charcoal. So and it, There was also a production uh, company in the Philippines that was making charcoal. And the Navy was shipping a lot of yeah. charcoal stateside for uh, uh, the small box respirators. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, that's part of why DuPont got pulled into that in a big way, because you need charcoal to make black powder, you know, so they were pretty well expert in the United States at that point in doing that. All right, let's jump over to uh, Chris. We're going to talk about things that go bang. <laughs> Ooh. Everyone loves uh, stuff that goes bang. Yeah. Um, I have three uh, firearms here that I'll talk about, uh, which I'm sure a lot of you guys are pretty familiar with them. Um, it, just about all of us have one, we bring them out to Newville, out to uh, Governor's Island and everything. Uh, just going to go on some uh, background to all of them. Uh, hopefully some stuff you guys don't know. Uh, I also have little kind of stories uh, with each of them. Uh, so first one, uh, which was the most widely used, is the 1917. Um, originally, uh, it was actually a British design that was sent to the Americans, because uh, at the beginning of the war, they didn't have the, uh, the production capabilities to make their Lee Enfields. Uh, they were really struggling with just keeping up with the whole demand of trying to get them up to the front. So Winchester and Remington uh, over here in the United States decided to start making them, uh, which it was designated the, uh, the P-14, I believe, uh, and it was chambered in the British 303 uh, uh, bullet, which is close to what the Americans used. So, so Fast forward, 1917, we get into the war, and we're suffering the same problems they were. We're really struggling to arm all the soldiers that are just flooding into the army now. And we turn to Remington and Winchester, who are already producing these rifles, and all their orders pretty much got canceled when, uh, when we joined the war. It's like, hey, uh, you guys, do you, do you refill all your machines just to chamber for 30-odd six? Uh, yeah, sure, no big deal. Uh, it was very simple swap because uh, 303 Brit and 30 odd six is very similar. Uh, they're pretty much the same caliber, uh, just like a little difference in the uh, the neck diameters for the bullets. Uh, so anyway, 
we went ahead with that. They totally outproduce uh, Springfield Armory, who was making the, uh, the current uh, 1903 Springfield, which was being used in the military, which I'll get to next. Um, hi, everyone. You have to say hi to my cat, too. Uh, Morticia approves. <laughs> so anyway, um, the first uh, soldiers and Marines went over to France. They were all still carrying the 1903 Springfield. Um, by the end of the war, um, pretty much everyone in the, uh, the U.S. Army was all carrying the 1917, just because how fast they could be produced and uh, just the fact that they were already um, producing a pretty large number of them by the time we entered service. Um, and cool little story, um, if you guys have ever seen the uh, Gary Cooper, Sar Sergeant York uh, movie, which I grew up watching that, you see him running around with his, uh, his Luger in his 1903. He was actually carrying the 1917. Uh, and in one of his uh, his uh, his diary entries, I believe it was, he actually wrote about it. So we got to France at Le Havre. There, there we turned in our guns, which was the 1903s, and got British guns. Well, we went out from Le Havre to a little camp inland. I had taken a liking to my gun by this time. I'd taken it apart and cleaned it enough to learn every piece, and I could almost put it back together with my eyes shut. I was the only mountaineer in the platoon, but I didn't like the British guns so well. I didn't think they were as accurate as our American rifles. And when it comes to accuracy, um, they both fire the same or the same cartridge, so they pretty much both have the same uh, max effective range uh, and maximum range, which is about 600 yards and uh, 5,500 yards for the two of them. Uh, the, Big thing that the 1917 did have was a bigger or a greater ammo capacity, which it's only one extra round. It can hold it six rounds inside the magazine, plus one in the chamber. Um, it doesn't sound like a whole lot, but if you're in the heat of battle, I mean, hey, that could really mean the difference between life and death. Um, so we had that going for it. Also, um, Personally, I love the sights in the 1917. Uh, for you guys who have the 1917 and the 1903, and you'll be able to actually shoot with them, uh, the sights are way different between the two. Um, I like the 1917 because it has a little peep sight. So it's, you, you look through a little circle, and you line up the uh, front sight post inside of it. Really easy to use, uh, especially when you're brand new to shooting. It's fantastic. Uh, and this sight was actually also used for the, uh, the BAR that – come on down the road for, uh, for World War II. So that was the 1917. The other rifle, which was the main battle rifle for the United States prior to World War I and during, uh, was the 1903. Um, this is my favorite out of the two, minus the sights. Uh, it's a lot lighter. Um, it's, it's about a half pound lighter, but it, it, half pounds make differences when you're marching uh, along dusty roads in France trying to get to the front. Uh, it's a little bit shorter, so it's easier to maneuver, uh, and it's and it's just a great rifle to have. Really easy to use. Um, so with the the 1903, um, it was made obviously 1903. It replaced the uh, the Krag Jorgensen rifle, uh, which the U.S. was using during the Spanish American War. Uh, during that war, when they were going up against the Spanish, they were actually found out that the Spanish Mausers were just crazy outperforming the Krag, uh, which for obvious reasons, once you get into like uh, the locking lugs and everything and how the uh, the rifle actually works. So the uh, United States went, they stole some of the Mauser rifles and they pretty much copied them, uh, which I have in World War II, K-98 here, which had pretty much the exact same action. If you hold them right together, it, they, they look almost identical. Uh, so you can definitely tell where, they, where the United States stole its uh, design from. So this was in service uh, from 1903 up until 1917. Uh, well, and like I said earlier, uh, the Springfield Army was just having a really hard time keeping the demand once we entered the war. Uh, so they started going with the 1917. Uh, but the United States Marine Corps was pretty much the only uh, branch that saw combat in World War One that 100% stuck with the 1903. Uh, if you read uh, like the, the Commandant's orders, uh, any uh, Marine memoirs from the time, pretty much all of them talk about having the 1903. 
Uh, that's not to say that they didn't take any other rifle. Uh, if you read Clifton Cates' memoirs, he actually even talks about carrying a label uh, during Bellu Wood because he lost his, uh, I think it was his pistol. Uh, he picked up a label and a German gas mask. Um, but it, it was just such a fantastic rifle, incredibly accurate. And uh, one testament to that was uh, during the Battle of Bellu Wood, the first time the Marines actually met in combat against the Germans, uh, Everyone thought they were just going to blow it. The Germans were just going to blow right through them and not care. Uh, but the Marines were able to stop them cold. And one reason why was because of the accuracy and the fantastic performance of the 1903. Uh, so a quick little excerpt here from one of my favorite books, uh, Miracle at Billy Wood. The Marines had opened up with machine gun fire and with rifle fire, extraordinarily accurate rifle fire. Thanks to Marine Corps training, which emphasized accuracy over fire, over speed, the French told us, Catlin recalled, that they had never seen such marksmanship practice in the heat of battle. So the part of its training, the other part of it is just the fantastic rifle. I, I mean, you're only as good as your rifle uh, in, when it comes to shooting. Uh, so uh, personally, it's my favorite rifle, 1903, fantastic. The last one I have to talk about, um, I was already warned that some of you guys might not enjoy this one as much, which I understand and I won't blame you. It's actually the Model 12 shotgun. Motherfucker. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I know there's a huge stigma of shotguns <laughs> in World War One. I. I know, I know. Uh, so one of the only reasons why I actually bring this up, uh, one, because it's the only other World War I uh, weapon I have. Two, I actually just read about this uh, at World War I not too long ago, and I really wanted to share it. Uh, but first, some background to this. Uh, this is the Model 12. It was designed off of the, uh, the 19, or 1897 Winchester, which was made uh, by John Browning. Uh, this came out uh, in 1912 as a civilian model with an ex or internal hammer. So uh, whenever you cocked it, you didn't have to worry about scraping your thumb up really bad, which is fantastic. And uh, it was later militarized by adding a heat shield and a bayonet lug, because according to Chesty Puller, every weapon needs a bayonet, including a flamethrower. So this weapon really didn't get over to France in, uh, in large numbers. It honestly really wasn't used a whole lot. And there's this huge myth that the Germans uh, they, they tried to protest and uh, claim the, the shotgun was uh, against all laws of war, and they were really making this big to-do about it. It's kind of true. Um, the Germans did protest the shotgun, uh, but it wasn't because they were just dying in mass droves because of it. Like They, they weren't treating every single German soldier for, uh, for shotgun wounds. It was just to make a big stink in the media. If you think about it, ever since uh, Germany invaded Belgium, uh, they've had a black eye because of the media. They, then they brought in the flamethrowers. They got blamed for all the poison gas, uh, all this stuff. So they just like, hey, you know what? You know, last last big hurrah. Let's try and call the U.S. out. Let's say that their shotguns are are causing all this crap. And, so it was kind of true. They did try to protest the shotgun, but it really wasn't a big thing like everyone makes it out to be. And lastly, uh, like I said earlier, I finally read something about the shotgun being used in combat in World War I. Um, and it comes from a book called Through the Week, the U.S. Marines in World War I. And I just thought I'd share it with you guys. So this is right before uh, the Marines stepped off to on their second to last campaign, which is Blancmont Ridge. Um, right here, so, some of the sergeants carried shotguns loaded with buckshot. There was a belief based on angry exchange of diplomatic protests in September that if the Germans caught a man with a shotgun, they would execute him on site on the grounds that such a weapon causing unnecessary suffering violated the laws of war. The US Department of State responded through neutral Swiss emissary that the German protest rang hollow, coming as it did from a nation that had introduced poison gas and flamethrowers into modern warfare. Adding that any summary executions of American prisoners would be met with reprisals in kind. The, the Marines knew little and cared less about the dispute, but many NCOs favored the weapon, typically, oh, I'm sorry, 
uh, typically Remington or Winchester 12 gauge pump shotguns fitted with slings and bayonet lugs for close close in trench works. So right there, um, uh, a good account of people actually using the shotgun and it being issued before combat. Uh, it also says that they enjoyed using the shotgun. Um, I kind of, I don't know if that's as accurate, maybe on a smaller scale they enjoyed using it, but typically it jammed a lot, especially with the cartridges they used. Um, but I mean, still, it served its purpose and it did, I guess, see a little bit of combat, but not much. And we have any questions for Chris? Yeah, this is Jared here. Um, hey, Chris, to your point about the cartridges, absolutely, man. When I was doing research for my, uh, my master's thesis, I was reading about the 35th Division, and uh, they, they get ready to step off for the Mose Argonne, and they pretty much talk about leaving the shotguns because all the cartridges got wet, and yep. they were just useless. Yeah, so, so they left them. Yeah, like uh, back then, um, they were still sticking with the uh, paper cartridges. They had introduced the brass cartridges, um, unfortunately, I don't know exactly when, uh, but I mean, it, it's paper. Once it gets wet, it just tears apart. It's soggy. It doesn't get chambered in properly. Uh, so it's just, it's completely worthless. And in a trench environment, everything gets soaked. And brass too, uh, brass works phenomenally in rifles. Uh, but once you introduce shotguns, which have a lot bit more carbon kickback into the chamber, uh, the fouling is just horrible horrible with the brass. I mean, uh, you, you'll get a couple that'll chamber properly, and then after that, you got to stop, uh, use a brush, try and clean it out somehow, and uh, that's just a giant pain in the butt. So, I mean, nowadays, you have these nice plastic rounds. You don't have to worry about it, but if it weren't for plastic, I mean, it would be horrible shooting a shotgun just with the amount of carbon that builds up. So Bro, both kind of Remington and oh, Union ahead. Metallic cartridge were working on the brass cartridges at that point, but they were just way too expensive that yeah. they couldn't figure out a way to make them, you know, that they, they, they couldn't figure out a way to make them cheap enough to go into mass production. Mm -hmm. Chris, I had a question. Um, yeah. I mean, it, it's been said a lot that a lot of a major reason why O2 you know, fields couldn't be turned out was just it was like almost such perfect craftsmanship. You just can't mis mass produce that. Um, so, yeah. I mean, that's one, that's one take. So, I yeah. mean, outsourcing to Winchester and Remington, uh, you know, I mean, I've heard people talk, oh, I've got an Eddie Stone or I've got a Rock Island. Yeah. What's the appreciable difference between armories on that? Uh, so, really, the main thing was the way, the number one way that they were able to outproduce them, um, other than the fact that all they had to do was retool some of their works and they go back to the making the 1917. Uh, two bigger companies, uh, I, I feel comfortable comfortable saying, uh, Winchester and Remington, uh, even today, well, not so much today, but I mean, they're huge powerhouses when it comes to uh, just building rifles. Also, from what I understand, uh, they, they didn't have as much off time for their workers, uh, and they also kept them working during the weekends. Um, so when I was... I haven't done crazy research into it, but uh, from what I understand, Springfield, uh, they stopped production on the weekends. Uh, Remington and Winchester, they had guys come in on the weekends and they would keep working. Uh, so that was one big way that they really uh, could keep up with the demand. Um, and yeah, I, I could agree with the, uh, the craftsmanship. I mean, the, uh, the, the 1917, it came from the P-14, which the British designed 100% just to simplify the uh, the lead end field and just to get guns mass produced as fast as possible. Um, so it, it is a lot more simple if you look at it. It doesn't have a lot of bells and whistles that 1903 does. Like it doesn't have the uh, that magazine cutoff switch or anything. It doesn't really have much of a safety besides that little thumb switch over here. On it, the, doesn't uh, the right it doesn't have yeah, the double exactly. safety. It doesn't have the double safety. Exactly. So it, it, just, it gets rid of a lot of the uh, the complex parts that the 1903 retained, which uh, I mean. Hey, little parts here and there that'll that'll really uh, really increase the time you need to make it. Um, Thanks, man. To your to um, I want to thank everybody for tuning in. Um, and if anybody else wants to do um, one of our featured speakers, that'd be great. Um, just hit me. I know Tom mentioned he wanted to to jump in. Yes. Um, and, and and also for suggestions on uh, a time for next week. Woo. Yay.
But um, I want to keep this to an hour. <laughs> and I really want to thank everybody for joining us tonight. This has been like fantastic and great for the community. It was a great idea, man. Thank you, Kevin. Agreed. Okay. Fun time, guys. Yeah, thanks. thanks. Breaks, up, breaks up long days. Yeah, yeah. yeah I'm, yeah. I'm really, really pleased. It was really great to see everybody. And next week we'll work on more of a more chat. But Thank I'm you, everybody. Too, okay? Right on. This was a lot of fun. Yeah. yeah. Cheers. Thanks, everybody. All Thanks, right. Everybody. Yeah. All right. Be safe, everybody. Bye now. Cheers.